I am very proud to introduce um, Tim Foster. Many of you have already heard him present maybe at a Rotary program. Um, he is one of our lead historians on the Ann Arbor Car Ferries. And you also notice there's two other historians here. We have Andy Bolander here this evening, as well as Grant Brown. So we're excited about that. But I will introduce Tim now. And here you go, Tim. I should mention that Tim is also on the board of the SS City of Milwaukee. So good afternoon, everybody. I'm, I'm so pleased to see all these people here to learn more about car ferry history. Uh, before we begin, I have a couple of acknowledgements to make. <clears throat> First of all, I wanna thank Barb Mort, our executive director over at the Benzie Museum. I wanna thank uh, my co-patriots on the committee, on the uh, exhibits committee, including Jane Perkis, Dave Reed, Jerry Heineman, uh, because they're all very supportive in these programs that we put together today. Um, I also want to thank Brian Vane, who is with us today, and Ann Larry White. Uh, Brian and I uh, worked with a person in Eastern Europe, believe it or not, to put together the video segments that you're going to see today about the Ann Arbor number four. Um, I also want to thank all the volunteers since 1982 that have hep helped keep the SS City of Milwaukee alive and available for public viewing so we could keep the whole car ferry story alive so the public can see it. And there are too many volunteers to mention over the years, uh, but we're very proud of the exhibit that we have in Manistee and anybody here that has not been down there, I encourage you to go down and see a real car ferry as she was built in 1930. So a hundred years ago, next week, the Ann Arbor number four uh, sank at the entrance to Frankfurt Harbor, which is the picture you see up here the mural, which is at the post office on the west wall of the Frankfurt Post Office. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with that mural in the post office. Those of you who are not, uh, this, this mural was painted in 1941 by the artist Harry Bernstein. Um, <clears throat> and it has been on the wall ever, you know, ever since 1941. It depicts a scene uh, on February 14th, 1923, of uh, the Ann Arbor number four uh, with their crew trying to save their ship when they were caught in a storm in Lake Michigan. Uh, you could see the car going overboard over the stern. Uh, the car is tipped over on the car deck, uh, the boat covered with ice. All in all, this is a pretty accurate uh, description of what happened that night. Um, and when I was first given the opportunity to give this program, we were just going to do it about the, the sinking. But when I started to put the material together, the boat had a very long life after this. She was in service for 50 years after this scene was painted. And she was in service for 17 years before this happened. So altogether, she had a long career, 67 years as a useful vessel on, in, you know, on Great Lakes service. So today, we're going to cover the history of the whole boat, not just the accident uh, from start to finish. Of course, the accident's going to be a big part of that. But uh, so, and we also have a little video segment, which we're gonna show. Now, so we're gonna try and see something a little bit different today. So we went to our, Brian and I went to our animator in Eastern Europe and to come up, to come up with these images, these animated images that you see today. And this is an example of one that he sent us. 
Larry? Are we all set? Yeah. Okay. So this is an example of uh, something we're going to try new here today, which which is something uh, that we uh, put together with the guy from Eastern Europe uh, based on pictures of the model that I sent him. One of the models that I made here, the Ann Arbor number four. And so we're going to start with a video segment that uh, describes the sinking. did we just see? Basically what we saw there is a little description of the trip that she made. She left Frankfurt on calm seas on the night of February 13th, 1923 and ran into a storm in mid-lake on Lake Michigan. She had a full load of 19 Uh, he's a naval architect who was the chief draftsman at American Shipbuilding in Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, his name was Robert Logan. He was a Scottish immigrant, emigrant here. Uh, he designed 11 car ferries from 1896 to 1911. Uh, he is generally uh, given credit for coming up with the design of the modern steel car ferry with the twin propellers and the two stacks that go forward and aft. Uh, the only two boats that, that deviated from this design were the Ann Arbor number three and four, okay, because they only had one stack and they also were about a hundred feet shorter than the other boats that Robert Logan designed. Um, he also, he had a hand in all of what we call the first generation car ferries from 1896 to 1911. After 1911, uh, the designs were taken over by other people and built by other shipyards, and Robert Logan kind of fades from view at that point. The Ann Arbor number four was 260 feet long. Uh, she had twin screws, twin propellers, 
she could carry about 20 cars. And she was rated at 1,200 horsepower, which is important because 1,200 horsepower probably wasn't enough power to help her make it through the storm, okay? Uh, later car ferries, as a, as a comparison, for, you, uh, for anybody here that's familiar with the SS Badger, the Badger's horsepower is 7,600. Uh, number four had 1,200 horsepower, all right? So she was one of the first generation car ferries and technology would change over the years, but, but, the, uh, but they were 100 feet shorter than the other Logan boats, especially the boats that the Pier Marquette Railroad had built. And they had five identical car ferries that averaged 350 feet long at this time. Also, another thing about the Ann Arbor number four is she and all the other uh, car ferries from this period is she had no stern protection. The stern was wide open to the sea. And when the boat was fully loaded, the distance from the car deck, where you see that flat piece of deck there, to a flat surface of the water was really about as tall as me. So when the seas would pick up, they were very easily washed into the car deck. And this is something that the Lake Michigan operator struggled with for many years. Uh, at some times they would even stack railroad ties on the stern to try and keep the water out, but not very effectively. When the number four ran into her storm trouble in 1923, she actually had a pair of swinging doors that were shaped in a V across the stern there to try and keep the water out. When the box car went over the stern, it took the wooden seagate along with it. So her, her stern was completely wide open to the seas. The Achilles heel on a lot of these car ferries is that when the water can come in and wash over the car deck, there are many, many openings that lead right down into the bottom of the boat. And if the water makes it up far enough, the water will seep down into the bottom of the boat and make her lower in the water. This is one of the troubles that the number four had during the storm was because she had to turn and run before the seas. And the water came up over the stern and was slowly swamping her as she made it back to Frankfurt. Uh, she arrived in Frankfurt in December 1906. Uh, this is her on her maiden voyage into Frankfurt Harbor. Uh, you can see that she's got her, build, her builder's pennant uh, flying from the foremast. And uh, she joined the other car ferries in, in the regular rotation of the boats out of Frankfurt. Now the car ferry business was growing uh, very rapidly during this time and especially into the 1920s. Uh, there were 11 car ferries that were in service in 1923. Two from Grand Haven, five from Ludington, and four from Frankfurt. And they were at full capacity almost all the time, um, uh, especially during the winter. And uh, and it was, uh, they were stressed out for, they were, they were maxed out on their capacity. But the number three, the number four took her first spot in a regular rotation of boats leaving Frankfurt. Uh, in this picture, you could see the number four is the boat uh, leaving Frankfurt there with the number three uh, ready to pull into the slip to be serviced there. You can also see the coal smoke, which completely obliterates the view of the Royal Fratinac Hotel, which was, uh, which was an issue with some of the people that lived in Frankfurt for many, many years. Number four gained, gained a reputation as being an unlucky boat. Now, she was involved in a series of accidents throughout her career as a car ferry. Uh, she went aground several times. In 1920, she hit a rock in trying to make Manitowoc Harbor and sank in the harbor. Uh, 
in this instance, this was in May of 1909, when she was at Manistique, Michigan, and they were loading iron ore onto the boat and they made an improper loading sequence and the boat turned over because there was too much weight on one side of the boat. So she turned over at her slip um, and it was, it was a major salvage problem. And what they had to do was they had to remove the plates on her starboard side okay, and bring in the wrecking tug favorite, which is the tug there, and and pull everything out that was there and pump her out and right her. And then she was towed back to Frankfurt and then towed to Milwaukee where she was rebuilt. So she gained a reputation as being an unlucky boat. Now, my opinion on that is that maybe she was the lucky boat because Ann Arbor number four made it back to Frankfurt when she was in a sinking condition. There were three other car ferries that sank during storms. The Marquette and Bessemer number two sank in Lake Erie in 1909 with 50 men. The Pier Marquette number 18 sank in 1910 with 36 of her crew and the Milwaukee sank in 1929 with 50 men. And so I would say that Ann Arbor number four was probably the lucky boat out of that group. So here she is at her slip being serviced, loaded or unloaded. Um, this picture dates probably to about 1903 or, or about 1907 or so. The Royal Frontenac, you could see in the background and there is a tug coming into Frankfurt Harbor there. So as time went on, the Ann Arbor fleet retired their first two ferries. Uh, well, actually the Ann Arbor number one burned in 1910 in Manitowoc. Uh, the Ann Arbor number two was retired in 1912 with the delivery of the Ann Arbor number five, which came uh, in 1911. Uh, she was bigger, more powerful, able to break ice. Uh, the service was evolving here a little bit. The boats were becoming bigger. Uh, they were more powerful and able to handle the winter conditions that they ran into uh, out on Lake Michigan. But once again, we could see the open stern of the Ann Arbor number four when she is tied up stern two to the uh, Ann Arbor number six. They were transferring cars here uh, because uh, one of the boats was probably stuck in the ice. And they would transfer cars from boat to boat to uh, lessen the weight and then eventually move the boat out of the ice. This was a pretty common practice but you could see the wide open stern of the number four there on the right. This picture was probably taken about 1918. Uh, car ferries, in my opinion, were only as good as the crews that worked on them. Um, on the night of February 13th, 1923, the captain of the number four was Captain Charles Fredrickson. Uh, he was a capable captain. He had been with the Ann Arbor uh, since the mid 1890s. His brother Axel also worked with him on the car ferries. Uh, they were Norwegian people who were capable seamen. Uh, he worked on all the car ferries that the Ann Arbor had running at the time and he was a very capable master. This picture from 1918 is right after he took command of the number four. Uh, this was due to a shuffling of the masters when Captain Charles Robertson, who lived in Frankfurt, uh, left to take his family to Ludington. And so uh, Fredrickson was given command of the number four. Her chief engineer that night was Moritz Dahlgren. 
who also was a career Ann Arbor employee. Uh, in this picture here, he was first assistant on the number four, but by the time 1923 came along, he was the chief engineer on the number four. These guys were tough men. Car ferry service was not an easy job, especially during the winter. Um, a lot of the time they had trouble keeping crews. Uh, very often the work that they did, especially on the car deck, it was cold, it was hard. Uh, you were handling a lot of heavy equipment and it just wasn't a very pleasurable job to have. Uh, but the officers were dedicated men and, and they knew they knew the boat, they knew the workings of the boat, and it was probably through their dedication and service that was one of the things that saved the number four on that night when she was caught out in Lake Michigan in what they reported to be 30 foot seas and 20 below zero temperatures. So here's another video segment of what it might have been like that night with the V-shaped Seagate, you could see it right there, and the boat rolling violently. Um, a note about this picture is that the eyewitness accounts say that her, the top of her rail would be underwater. Now, um, Anybody that's been to the city of Milwaukee and has been up on the spar deck of the city of Milwaukee, if you could stand there and picture the boat like this, that's what they're saying. Um, I know that the seas covered her whole spar deck uh, when she was out during the storm. They even tore off part of the railing off the, off the uh, spar deck. Um, and so if you could picture yourself on a boat that's like this with a full load of railroad cars when it's 20 below zero and you're trying to make it back to port. But she did. And, and she came to rest right inside the south break wall. Now the break walls are different than the ones that we have today. These were two straight piers that went about 1,200 feet out into the lake. And the issue with that is that it didn't offer these boats any protection when they were trying to come in in any kind of a seaway. Uh, and the entrance was narrow enough so that it was pretty hard to make that entrance. Um, and also what happened here is that a wave picked up the boat and drove it down onto the bottom breaking off her starboard propeller and also almost tearing off her rudder. So she had no way of making it into the harbor. She hit the bottom and, and, and laid there. So the Benzie County Patriot, this is from February, uh, the Thursday, February 16th. Uh, the boat sank on the 15th. And it's reporting uh, about what happened during the accident. But what's also interesting here is a human interest story that we see here in Frankfurt and also with these car ferry crews. The guys that worked on these boats were a very tight knit community. And they were all very well known in town and uh, very well revered around town. And if you notice down here, There is a little article that says, popular boy dies suddenly. The popular boy that they're talking about here is Captain Fredrickson's 15-year-old son. And he passed away the week before the accident happened. And this was Charles Fredrickson's first trip back after mourning the death of his son. Uh, and 
even down at the bottom of the article, there's a little spot that says the Fredrickson family wishes to thank the crew of both four for their well wishes uh, concerning the death of the uh, the death of his son. Um, and so this is a, this was buried in the front page of the Patriot for that day, uh, but it very much fits into the story. Now also, he had two other family members on board with him. Uh, he had a son, Art, Art Fredrickson, who would go on for another long career with the Ann Arbor. He was one of the wheelsmen that night on the number four, and his brother, Axel Fredrickson, was first mate on that trip. Uh, and so once again, you could see how tight knit these, these guys were that worked for the railroad. So the boat lay there. Um, all the crew made it off safely. And luckily she was not in the way of incoming or outgoing traffic. So she didn't obstruct the other car ferries. This was taken. Uh, not too long after the sinking, but from the deck of the Ann Arbor number six, this was taken by the radio operator uh, that day. And there was really nothing they could do except hire a salvage company and wait for the weather to clear. Uh, by all accounts, the weather during the spring of 1923 was terrible. They had a couple of big snowstorms. There were several times when rail traffic just stopped. No mail could get in, no coal could get in, um, and really the weather didn't clear until early May. And so she lay there. And you could see the ice build up around her, the ice build up on the hull. Once again, this picture was taken not too long after the accident. And also we have a very good documentation of this because the boat sat there for so long. And there were photographers that would go down and, and look at the boat. This one and a ser whole series of pictures uh, and postcards were taken by William Sharp, who you can see his name down on the lower right-hand corner there. Uh, he took a lot of images of Benzie County uh, during the late teens through the 1920s. He even had a retail store in Frankfurt where he would uh, sell his pictures where the rock shop is now. That was Sharp Studio. And she was frozen in for the spring. Um, and they had really, there was really nothing they could do except for the weather to clear and get warmer so they could start to work on the salvage operation. The Reed Wrecking Company of Port Huron, Michigan was hired to uh, salvage the boat, which was not easy. As the weather cleared and the ice went out, uh, she just sat there. Here's another picture after the ice had gone out with the Ann Arbor number six uh, coming into Frankfurt, passing the sunken number four. And you could still see some ice build up on the south break wall there. So salvage work started. Um, the only way they could pump the water out of the boat was to cover up the stern. And so what you see here is they're building a coffer dam across the stern of the sunken number four. The Ann Arbor number three is the car ferry next to her, tied up next to her. And they would, uh, divers would go down into the lake, into the water, and put the coffer dam together so the stern was sealed. And they were, and then they started pumps down on the car deck, down in the bilge to pump the water out. There were some cars that were pretty close to the stern. Now, losing cars over the stern of a car ferry is not something you want to see happen. Uh, the car that she lost went over by accident. In 1896, seven cars rolled off the stern of the Ann Arbor number one by accident. 
the only time that cars were successfully pushed off the start of a car ferry that, that I'm aware of was on the Pier Marquette 18 in 1910, and they managed to jettison 13 cars off the stern to try and lighten the boat so she wouldn't sink. But she was taking on water so much uh, that it didn't really matter. So, uh, but these cars were uh, jammed up towards the stern of the boat. So they put a steam wrecker on the stern of the number five, which you see there, and brought her close to the stern of the number four and cleared the cars off of the stern so they could build the coffer dam. The railing that you see damaged here on the port side of the number four is railing that was damaged during the storm when she made the turn. So the waves took off the steel railing there. Once they got inside, they could see the, the real extent of the damage on the car deck. Uh, the man closest to the camera is the chief engineer Dahlgren. Uh, he's sitting in the hatch that goes down to the engine room. Um, you could see one of the rail cars that's been uh, uh, knocked over, you know, uh, kind of turned aside there. Uh, and you could see where the level of the water came up. We call that, you know, like a bathtub ring, you could see there. That's how deep the water was where she was sitting. And you can also see some of the damaged stanchions. Um, it's the miracle here is that the boat was so torn up on the inside that it's it's very it's pretty amazing that she was able to operate at all because if you lose steam that goes to the engines you know she's a steamship so if you don't have steam pressure the engines don't work and if one of these cars hits a main steam connection then you lose the steam pressure to run the engines and that didn't happen Here's the engine room crew sitting down in the engine room of the number four and also Chief, uh, Chief Engineer Dahlgren is the guy sitting in the middle there. And also notice all the coal that's down on the floor of the engine room. Now, the cargo for the number four consisted of 17 cars of coal. And in order to keep them from rolling back and forth during the storm, uh, a lot of the coal was dumped out of the cars to just keep them in place. And some of this coal is what came down through the engine room hatch down onto the floor of the engine room. The other three guys that are with them were also all career, uh, all career Ann Arbor employees down in the engine room there. So you can see the damage to the inside of the ship here. The center stanchions were bent. Uh, the boat rolled that, and keep in mind that these center stanchions are heavy duty I-beams, you know, that are, you know, built by the shipyard to keep the deck up and, uh, and the force that was necessary to bend those the way they are must have been really something to have that car tipped like that. And like I said before, it's really pretty amazing that the, the boat made it back at all, which makes her the lucky boat, not the unlucky boat. Once again, this picture was taken by William Sharp. This is looking out towards the stern. And the stairs that you see here are the stairs that that went from the car deck up to the cabin deck. And you could see how they've been torn away by the, by the freight uh, losing its place on the inside. And you can also see some of the salvage crew standing up on one of the cars over on the port side of the boat there. So a large pump was brought in and fitted towards the stern. You could see the pump there with that, that big round thing is a large centrifugal pump to pump out the bilge 
And you could see some of the same freight cars that we saw in the other pictures that are, are laying there. Um, and they proceeded to bump, pump the boat out. And also on the car deck, you could see some of the gear that was used to fasten the cars in place, which failed on that trip. And um, anybody that handles the gear to fasten these cars uh, will see that that jack right there, that long thing that's kind of laying there, that's a rail car jack used to jack up the car, uh, weighs almost 200 pounds. And so once in place, this stuff is meant to stay in place. If it comes loose during a storm, it's almost impossible to get back in place. So she was pumped out in late May, 1923. And they towed her back into Frankfurt Harbor. And so here you could see the coffer dam across the stern. You could see the reed wrecking tug is over on the other side of the boat. And you can see that they're still pumping water out of the bilge by that pipe that comes out of the starboard side there. Uh, and they managed to get her back into Frankfurt and prepare to have her taken over to Manitowoc, Wisconsin, uh, where the Manitowoc shipbuilding was to have her repaired. So they even managed to get steam up on the boat. And she was towed by the Ann Arbor number five in the foreground there and the, uh, the tug Arctic in the stern who when the that tug was a, uh, a fixture for many, many years in Manitowoc Harbor. And they towed her across the lake to Manitowoc to have her repaired. Um, and she was a real mess. I mean, the insides were torn up. Uh, and she just needed, uh, you know, some more work on the cabins. Uh, it was it was just a bad scene, and and the repairs ran to about a hundred thousand dollars to fix her back up. So after the accident happened, the superintendent of the Ann Arbor Railroad, Ralph Reynolds, went on record saying that in his view. It was the low level of Lake Michigan that prevented Ann Arbor number four from making it into Frankfurt Harbor. Uh, and there were other lake people that were claiming that the lake was going down as a result of water that was being drained into the Chicago River. And it was lowering the level of Lake Michigan. They documented that the lake had gone down by 33 inches in eight years. And he maintained that if the lake had been higher, she would have been able to make it into port without hitting the bottom. Now, whether this is true or not, you, you don't really know, but, um, but this was uh, uh, quite a big uh, controversy at the time. Um, and there were other people that that agreed with him. I'm not really sure what the city of Chicago maintained about this, but my guess is that the city of Chicago won whatever happened. While the Ann Arbor number four was being rebuilt at Manitowoc, uh, the railroad chartered the Pier Marquette 17, another Logan boat to come up from Ludington to fill in because they needed they needed the uh, extra capacity uh, because they were so busy at the time. So the Pier Marquette 17 was here from May 1904, from May 1923 through October 1923. And this is her at Ludington in front of the old Ludington grain elevator. So the number four came back in October of 1923. And she had new cabins put on. Her car deck was shored up again. Uh, but please notice that they did not add a Seagate. Now, they still had the swinging doors that went across the stern of the ship. And you can faintly see one uh, down on the uh, port side there. 
uh, number three and four were not given Seagates until 1930 uh, for some reason. Uh, so she went back into service uh, and she was generally, you know, fixed up to the point where she had nicer accommodations and they moved the pilot house up one level, uh, but somebody forgot to add the Seagate. In 1924, when this picture was taken, you could see the three off to the left there and the four with their swinging doors across the stern. And you could see how low they are uh, and how little protection they would offer against the heavy sea wave. And also notice how far off, how far back to the stern they have the, the uh, freight loaded. This is the winter of 1924. Um, she sailed through the 20s. Uh, after 1925, uh, she was put into sporadic service. Now, the car ferry service was changing dramatically here. In 1924, between 1924 and 1931, nine new car ferries would be built, eight of them by Manitowoc Shipbuilding. Uh, Two new boats came out in 1924. The Ann Arbor number no. seven came out in 1925. And then there were three that were built for the Grand Trunk Railroad between 1927 and 1931, including the city of Milwaukee. Uh, so with the larger capacity, the bigger boats, uh, the better ability to work during the winter months and break ice, uh, the number four was put into really kind of a standby service. They didn't really need her anymore. Uh, but also notice by this time that there is a Seagate on the stern that was added in 1930. Uh, so she was towed to the east end of uh, Betsy Lake and tied up. And she only worked sporadically through, through the late 20s and into the 30s. This is the Ann Arbor number no. seven coming out in 1925. Uh, a bigger boat, more powerful, bigger capacity. Uh, six of these boats were built to an identical design. This boat later became the Viking, which I'm sure many of you remember. The Wabash would be delivered in 1928. And she was generally considered to be the Ann Arbor's best boat for many years. Once again, a uh, bigger boat, bigger passenger accommodations, better equipped to handle the winter months. Uh, and this is, these are the boats basically that, that made the number four obsolete. In 1937, <clears throat> Michigan State Ferries, which transported automobiles and passengers between Mackinac City and St. Ignace, uh, purchased the Pier Marquette 20, the Pier Marquette 17, and the Ann Arbor number no. four, and put them into service, uh, taking people and cars back and forth between the Lower Peninsula and the Upper Peninsula. Uh, this is all before the Mackinac Bridge was built. Between 1937 and 1957, they transported 12 million automobiles and 30 million passengers this way. And at times, uh, especially during hunting season, the traffic would be backed up for 16 miles from Mackinac City waiting to get across into the UP. So this is basically the second life of the Ann Arbor number no. four. And she served in this capacity from 1937 until 1957. And she was a big part of this fleet and also noticed that her Seagate now is, is in the raised position and no doubt would have helped her uh, in February of 1923. In 
1947, her bow was opened so she could take automobiles in by the bow or by the stern. In 1957, the uh, Mackinac Bridge opened and these boats were now were obsolete and they were all laid up. So in 1957, a man named Edward H. Anderson who lived on Washington Island over in Door County purchased two of the ferries, the old Pier Marquette 20 and the old Ann Arbor number no. four, had their engines taken out and use them to store potatoes during the potato season. Now this is her third life as a boat, as a potato boat. Now, the reason for this is they had one, uh, the, the hold below the water line was cool because of the lake water. And so they could store potatoes down there during the harvest season and not have to worry about them spoiling or sprouting. And between the two boats, they could handle 200,000 bushels of potatoes, believe it or not. So, uh, and then after the harvest was in, these boats would be towed down to Benton Harbor and the potatoes would be processed, which took about eight months. And then they would be towed back to Door County in the spring with fertilizer and other farm equipment. She did this from 19, uh, 1957 until 1973. So this was her third life for the unlucky boat as, as a potato boat. And they worked very well in, in this service. In 1973, in the fall of 1973, they were sold and her and the Pier Marquette 20 were uh, towed over to the St. Lawrence Seamway and then towed over to Spain for scrapping. So after the picture, after the mural in the post office, the boat served for 50 years in various, in various uh, capacities and was really very good at what she did. And so at the city of Milwaukee, one of the things, one of the missions that we have is to remember the crew members that worked on the car ferry service because they were the people that kept everything together and kept the boats running. And we always say, who will remember them? Okay. So to end the program, we have a couple of uh, crew shots here. Uh, the guy on the left uh, was on the number four when she sank in 1923. This picture was taken in 1914 on the number five, who, which was fairly new at the time. Uh, you could tell the determination in these guys' faces. These guys were tough men. They knew their job. This is on the number four. And also recognize the ladies that are up on the bridge wing too. So it wasn't just men. It was ladies too that helped, that were part of the crew. And finally, on the number five, uh, the captain is that large man on the right with his suit on, with his three-piece suit on. Looks like he's getting ready to go off watch. But it's always important to remember the people that worked on these boats and their relatives that, that still many of them are here in the area or, and they, they check in with us at the museum. and. Um, and their stories are always appreciated at the museum to keep the memory of the crew alive. Um, and if anybody has any questions about the program, I'll be glad to take those now.
Okay, the question is, is did the captain intentionally come straight back to Frankfurt, right, correct? No, no, that just kind of happened. Now, it's pretty amazing. One of the amazing parts of the story is that they made it back to Frankfurt at all because the talk in the pilot house at the time when they made the turn was where are we headed? Because all they had in the pilot house was a compass. That's all they had. So they had a compass heading. Some of the officers thought that they were headed to Point Betsy. Some of the officers thought that they were headed farther south. They didn't really know where they were. They did have wireless contact, which was fairly new at the time. And they were in wireless connect, they were in wireless contact with the station at Frankfurt uh, during, during you know, the time that this happened. And the operator wrote them back and said, we think you're pretty close because the signal is so strong. And then the, the next thing you knew, they were sitting next to the south wall. So did he do that on purpose? No, uh, but it makes for a good story. <laughs> uh, he's asking if there is a lighthouse on the pier. Yes, there is a lighthouse on the uh, north pier, which had been installed in 1912. And another thing that happened because of the sinking was uh, the Arrowhead breakwater that we have in Frankfurt today was constructed finally as a result of the sinking. Now, uh, they had been lobbying for this to be done for many years to provide a basin for the boats to come in and not just try and have to go through the two narrow piers, but have the stilling basin, which is the Arrowhead breakwater. Uh, the one in Ludington had been completed in 1923. Uh, as a result of the sinking, the, fu the funding for the Arrowhead breakwater was finally approved by the government and they were in place by 1932. Uh, the question is, were the original piers made out of wood? Yes, they were made out of wood filled with stone. All the way in the back. Hey, Jed, how you doing? Ned.
comes into the cross and grave and the holy city falls. That's what it says. The question is, is how, how did she come about? In the middle of the lake, in 30-foot seas, uh, when everybody, when everything on the inside was being torn up. This is what makes her a lucky boat. Because she, by all accounts, it took her 20 minutes to make the turn. Okay? And, and the curse of any Great Lake steamer, whether it's a laker or a car ferry or a passenger boat, anything is to get caught in the trough of the seas. They always tell you to head in, head into the lake, head into the waves. Uh, so really, it's just that's part of the miracle of the story that she was able to make that turn. And that's when you see all that damage on the inside of the car deck was everything was going like this at the time that caused all that damage. And, and like I said, they, uh, the crew said that she laid in the trough for 20 minutes before she came about. Yes, that's when she was headed into the seas, but but in those, in those types of seas, they were having trouble, no matter if they were heading into the seas or trying to make the turn, it was just a bad situation no matter where they were. Well, you know, when they were searching for the Confederate gold, Okay. They, I believe they discovered some coal hoppers at the bottom of the lake. Now, I thought, uh, the question is, did they, can they recover any of the cars that went off? Uh, I believe the coal hoppers that they found in the lake might have been the ones that they took off with the number five and they took them out into deep water and just let them drop, I think. I've never seen uh, any documentation on that, but I did hear when they were looking for the Confederate gold that that's what happened. All the way in the back. Uh, her question is, is about Seagates. And right, the, the first car ferry that came out with a factory installed Seagate was the Ann Arbor number no. five. Uh, the Seagate was five feet tall and raised and lowered by chains. The Pier Marquette 18, the second, which was uh, built to replace the sunken Pier Marquette 18 from 1910 also came out with a factory installed Seagate. The Milwaukee was fitted with a Seagate in 1911, but during her demise in the storm of 1929, that piece of equipment failed and was bent across the back of the stern. And it's still, it's still attached to the ship. Uh, in 1923, after the sinking of the Ann Arbor number no. four, the Pier Marquette had Seagates installed on all the rest of their boats that did not have one. Um, as a result of the sinking of the Milwaukee in 1929, the Seagate height was raised from five feet to eight feet, six inches. The Seagate on the Badger, I believe is 10 feet tall, uh, but even then uh, the last documented story I know of damage to a Seagate happened on the Badger sister ship, the Spartan, when she was caught in a storm in 1964, and even her 10-foot high Seagate was damaged by the seas. So it was not a fail-safe uh, option. Anybody else? Sure. Probably because they got more money. Yeah. <laughs> 
So thanks everybody for coming. And please come out and support the Veterinary Museum. Uh, we'd love to see you there. And also please come down and see the collection of this one. The museum is currently open on Wednesdays and Fridays from 11 to 4, and we have a wonderful car ferry exhibit, so we'd love to see you. Thank you so much. Be safe going home. Thank you, Tim. <laughs>